Oh, now we all know we're being recorded. It just got serious. <laughs> Everyone was talking and I was like, I don't want to be on the record. Uh, well, good morning. Welcome. Um, I'm, I'm just going to be sans mask today um, for, for any, for your edification, for any anxieties. I'm double vaxxed and boosted and good about all this stuff. So apparently I'm also a hand waver today. So let's get that. <laughs> So uh, as was said during service, uh, my name is Chris Odie, and I am honored to serve as the pastor of what is known as the Livingstones Prison Congregation. Um, I'm going to try and remember to give you some attention as well on Zoom, so I will try to look over, um, although I think your cameras are all off, and I wouldn't see it because it's behind me, so we'll, we'll make it work. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay, though, as I'm told that the balance is going well, so... And I will try to remember to repeat any questions that folks ask to make sure that you, you hear them also. Um, I guess to start off with just to get a, a lay of the land, uh, have any of you back in the before times, have any of you come to worship with us at Living Stone before? Oh, cool. Okay. That actually is, don't get me wrong. I'd love it if you were all like, yes, we know it all. But this is also good because it tells me where I can, where I can start. So Living Stones, just to give you some context, we are, as it sounds, we are a prison congregation. That is to say, we are a congregation of incarcerated men or male-identified inmates at the Washington Correction Center and Shelter. That means that I don't have an outside congregation. I have the prison. So when I go into the prison, I'm going to church and I'm worshiping with the members of my congregation. And we do that during the week so that I'm free to come to congregations like yourself here on the weekend. That makes sense? Normally I phrase that smoother, but it's been a little bit since I've been, <laughs> you know, in, in, around people. Um, <laughs> it's not completely true, but it's, it's been a couple of weeks actually since I've had any places to go. Um, Living Stones has been around since 2006. Um, in this current capacity, its roots go back much further. You could argue they go back into the 80s, but we don't need to argue today. Lord knows there's enough of that in the world. But um, its, its roots go back quite a way. But as a formal congregation of the ELCA, of the Lutheran Church, go back, goes back to 2006, with the idea being that instead of bringing church to the prison, a church and a community would be built and developed inside the prison, and people from the outside could come in to have that experience of worshiping inside and finding God in a place where most of us wouldn't necessarily expect to find God. Okay, I'm getting all those great nods. I, I wanna thank you for that because especially when I can't see this part of your faces. I mean, I, I work with a lot of Lutherans so I'm accustomed to nodding being <laughs> our version of amen, but it's, it's, still, uh, it's still helpful to have the nod. So I do appreciate that. Um, until recently, we have solely existed at the prison and shelter, but somehow during the pandemic, we have now uh, positioned ourselves so that we are now on the verge of starting a second congregation at the prison in Monroe. And I cannot overstate to you how ridiculously awesome that is. Yes. Um, both because of the, thank you, uh, both because <laughs> of the opportunities that that provides for another group of incarcerated individuals to have this experience, but also pragmatically, it makes it so much easier for more people to go inside to have the experience of worshiping alongside these incarcerated brothers. Um, I, I'm going to frequently today refer to the men um, just as like a preface beforehand. The reason I do that is because um, one, it's a prison for male identified inmates. Um, which is its own thing. I do actually have a couple of transgender congregants, um, but they are uh, in the wrong place if you follow my, my math on that. Um, but additionally, that's a deliberate choice on my part because inside we always refer to the inmates. And I don't like to do that, especially when I'm talking to anyone else or when I'm speaking to them. Um, because you know, part of this whole thing is about humanizing people. And, uh, when you keep referring to someone as an inmate or a prisoner or, you know, a bad person, a criminal, all these terms that we often use, uh, it becomes very easy to other them. And that makes it much easier to forget about them. And that makes it much easier to walk away. So most of today is going to be kind of a Q&A and conversation. Um, but I wanted to give you that, that kind of initial setup 
the basics being again, Living Stones is a prison congregation. So a congregation inside the prison. We bring people in, I'm gonna just pretend the pandemic never happened for a moment. We bring people inside to experience worship with the incarcerated community inside. And then we also do a lot of work working with other organizations uh, with uh, reentry resources. And lately we've been doing a lot of work with the uh, Faith Action Network, uh, which is an organization out of Olympia that uh, does a lot of lobbying and advocacy work with the legislature, um, working on prison reform and other forms of legislative reform. And I got the nods, so I think most of you were with me on that. I wanted to show you a couple quick things um, on, on the interwebs, as it were. Um, one, to give you context of the congregation, but also just to, to, to show you some things that I find interesting. Um, if we could go to the map first, that would be great. Yeah, this is prison's map on the uh, upper right. The, the browser tab, uh, the far right browser tab. Wait, wait, a little wait, more wait. up. Yeah. Yep, there you go, perfect. Okay, so it's not huge, but you get the general gist. So this is a map of Washington State. And you're lucky because the last place I spoke was a high school in Linwood and uh, I had to draw the map. And you don't want to see me draw a map <laughs> of Washington State. Apparently, I think the Kitsap Peninsula is huge. I learned that on my most recent draw. Um, anyway, so this is basically you know map here of Washington State. And then these red dots are where our prisons are in the state. So how many of you have lived in the state for a while? Let's say 10, 20 years. OK. Um, and if you haven't, I'm not trying to exclude you, I promise. Um, where do most of the people in the state live? West side, right? And specifically, Puget Sound, right? Um, and actually, maybe if you're new, you still do that too. Two thirds of our state lives between Olympia and Everett. Um, two thirds. That's that's a lot. That's two thirds specifically. Um, <laughs> my wife's a math teacher. <laughs> uh, the reason that that is even more critical to recognize, though, is that makes our state, when it comes to the land, incredibly rural. Um, you know, it's why we get those maps that you see every election, where it's, you know, we don't need to get into the politics of it, although I will if you really want to. But um, it's why when you look at the maps of our state, it's deceptive, because when you look at the land, it's incredibly rural with all of that entails in terms of voting patterns and just how things work. But the majority of our people don't live there. Well, eyeballing quickly, what do you notice about all those red dots on where the prisons are located? They're where the people aren't. <laughs> uh, this map isn't perfect because it doesn't show you like the population centers, but you really start to quickly realize that the majority of two thirds of our people live in the Puget Sound area, and one third of our people are spread across the rest of the state you start to realize that most of the prison locations we have chosen are in areas far removed from where the bulk of the people live. I'm not saying there's no one there, but they aren't in our denser populated places. Um, arguably a couple exceptions to that. Uh, the women's prison, where's the women's prison located? Right down the road. <laughs> no, where, where is it located? Right. right. What's its address? There you go. <laughs> Isn't that funny? We call it the Purdy Prison, but, not but its address is in Gig Harbor. Everyone refers to it as Purdy. No one says the women's prison in Gig Harbor, right? Why? We don't want to stay in our reputation. We don't want to say that it's here. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that you should rename, you know, or re rethink of that. But but the point I'm trying to get at is that psychologically, we we make choices as a community on what we do with not just the placement of these prisons physically, but mentally. We do whatever we can to push them away and try to think of them as not being a part of who we are. And we see that in where we've chosen to put them. We also, you could say, well, okay, Chris, that's, that's a great point to make morally, but, but the land out there is cheaper. You're right, the land out there is cheaper. That's one of the reasons why we do that, because prisons take up a lot of land. 
And as we've seen with the expansion of the, uh, the light rail, <laughs> buying land at Puget Sound is not cheap. So if you build a big prison out in a rural area, well, it's a lot cheaper to do that. You also have the advantage that more than likely you're going to have a, a population body that's happy about the jobs, right? You're not going to get that same NIMBY pushback, not in my backyard. One of my, least, my absolute least favorite prison in the state, uh, if we can cycle off just to Eastern Washington a little bit, my least favorite prison in the state is that dot just mm -hmm. north of Kennewick, south of Owens Lake. That is the prison that's Coyote Ridge. It's one of our largest prisons in the state. Um, it is one of our newest prisons in the state. And if we were to look at a satellite view of it, what you would see is a bunch of concrete and a bunch of brown. It is a desolate, uh, depressing place. It is a rough place to be in general. Um, but our largest or one of our largest state prisons is there. And it's there because no one complained. It's there because the land is cheap. And it had a huge COVID outbreak. It did. Many of our prisons have had huge COVID outbreaks. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but that's one of the main things I want to get, give you, just this visual. I think it does a really interesting job of showing kind of how, how we have physically done what we can to push this problem out of sight. What's that saying? Out of sight? Out of, out of mind. We also say absent makes the heart grow fonder, which is weird because we have a lot of idioms that contradict each other, but still out of sight, out of mind. And I think we know that on some level. Um, well, thank you for bringing that up. Some, so in theory, our goal when we incarcerate someone is we're hoping for some form of reform or rehabilitation, right? In theory, let's just whatever else. In theory, that's what we're going for, I think. I hope. Is that what we're going for? We hope. We hope. Let's just admit hope. Okay. Well, statistically, things that help with that are things that, frankly, are pretty common sense. Um, programming helps with that. Access to family visitation helps with that. Being treated humanely helps with that. But those first two in particular, programming and visitation, well, if two thirds of our state lives in Puget Sound, where do you think the majority of our inmates come from? Puget Sound. Where do you think the majority of their families live? Puget Sound. Which means as soon as we've incarcerated someone out in Coyote Ridge, what are the odds that that person is from, what is it, Connell, and that their family is as well? They're pretty bad. The odds are really good that that person's family is going to have to travel for multiple hours to get out to do a visit one way. And then they're going to have to travel for multiple hours to get back home. And if we're honest about where the majority of our individuals who are incarcerated come from, most of them aren't coming from the wealthiest of families. <coughs> so let's hope they have access to a car because there is no bus line that goes between Seattle and Connell. <laughs> There are some volunteer services that help with that. And I'm grateful that they exist, but there's no regular public transportation between that. So let's assume for a moment you've got a car and you're up for it. You've somehow gotten the time to go do that drive. You're talking multiple hours to get out there, multiple hours to get back. You probably can't afford a hotel stay. So you gotta do it in a day. That's also to make sure you don't take time off of work. So as you can quickly see, it becomes very difficult for someone to get a lot of visitation and support. The same thing then happens with the program. Can you guess which prison in the state has the, the most, gets the, has the easiest time getting volunteers and programming set up? Well, I won't make a guess. It's been rough. I make another comment. Yeah. Uh, state library operates, branch library is an old institution. Yes. Yes, it does. Yes. Uh, I'm a former state library. Uh, the, the most difficult places to recruit library staff, again, are in the world. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely true. If, if you didn't hear that <coughs> online, the point was made up that the, uh, that the state library system does have branches in the prisons and they are connected to the state system. And just as it is harder to get librarians in more rural communities to begin with, it is also substantially harder to get them at rural prisons, which obviously are in rural communities. 
So that's one of the other problems we've created by the way that we've done this, the way that we have set this up, is we've created a system in which the majority of the people who are incarcerated, people who we know benefit greatly from programming, volunteers, support from their friends and family. We have then warehoused them in parts of the state where it is, ex <laughs> I almost said excrementally hard. <laughs> that was Freudian. Uh, <laughs> exponentially more difficult for them to actually uh, benefit from those resources. So, um, you know, I was going to show you a video about living stones, but now we're going out a whole different track. Let's end with that video about living stones. That's what we'll do. It's less than a minute. So, um, but let's, uh, if you could switch this over to the visiting tab, just so we have a, a better picture of something. That's good enough. Um, okay. So that was a little bit about the prison system, a little bit about living stones. Um, let's just talk. What can I, what can I answer for you, or at least try to help with? What thoughts are on your mind? What other, are there other congregations within uh, Shelton or other places besides uh, Livingstone? So uh, Livingstone uses a model of ministry created back in Baltimore in the early 80s. Uh, called the Prison Congregations of America. And it was begun by a Lutheran pastor out in Baltimore, Ed uh, Nesselhoff, I think his name is, um, that was focused on this building a, a functioning congregation inside, having a pastor called inside all of this. And again, that's one of the big stipulations here is that it's, it's the focus is building this community inside and bringing people in as opposed to bringing the church in. That's not to say that that's not also good. It's just not the focus that we have. Um, that model of ministry, there's about three dozen congregations that use that model across the country. We are a little rare in our state in that we have multiple prisons with that model present. Uh, there is a uh, ministry, or at least there has been a ministry at the women's prison in Purdy uh, that was begun by the Presbyterians back in 2018, uh, Hagar's Community Church. And they have a similar setup where they have a pastor who's been called inside and, and works in there. There are other faith communities and other faith groups that are inside the prison doing, doing good work. Um, but one of the things that has been very complicated for the last two years has been the pandemic. I realize that's a very big understatement in general. But just as was talked about in worship uh, a moment ago, the pandemic, while it has been traumatic and grief-filled for us on the outside, it has also very much been traumatic and grief-filled on the inside. And part of that has been uh, heightened by the lack of volunteers and visitors being able to come inside. When the pandemic began, one of the first things that happened was that visitation and volunteerism was just stopped. Most of our programming is handled by volunteers. So most of our programming stopped, just hard stop. Um, at times over these last two years, visitors have been allowed back inside, family members, friends, that sort of thing. But it's been sporadic. And when we've started to see outbreaks come back, then it's been halted again. Um, so we are coming off a period right now, about two months, give or take, where uh, visitation was shut down and is now starting to come back up. I just received an, uh, a message yesterday from one of our longtime volunteers that for the first time now since uh, March, no, yeah, March of 2020, we just got word that our volunteers are about to be let back in. I'm, I am beyond excited. I'm also, how do I put this? I am so excited and I'm also really hesitant to be excited because we have been told so many times over the last two years that volunteers were about to come back in. So even though I now see it in print or in email, uh, like until they give me a hard date and I see my people walk inside, it's kind of like, I'm excited, but I'm terrified that you're gonna do this to me again because or to all of us because this has happened several times. So there are many other church groups that go in, but what's been complicated the last two years is that only a few of us have still had access. Within the Department of Corrections, people are classified as staff, uh, staff has blue badges, contractors have yellow badges, and volunteers, regular volunteers have red badges. 
So, uh, so blue, yellow, red. You don't want a green patch. That means that you're an inmate. Um, that's just the reality of it. Contractors have been allowed in for most of the pandemic. I'm classified as a contractor. So I have still had access for most of the pandemic to go inside and to support the actual, uh, the actual Department of Corrections chaplain and meet with the men and lead worship services and, and do, do the work, do the stuff that I was called to do uh, three and a half years ago. But none of our volunteers have been inside since February 29th of 2020. That date is <laughs> indelibly um, etched in my brain. I will never forget that date. We gathered for worship. We had this amazing experience. There was almost a hundred of us. We had uh, this a guest speaker from a reentry ministry. Um, we were collecting uh, forms, get guys hooked up with reentry services. Everything was amazing. And then over the next two weeks, everything fell apart. But you all lived through that too, so you know that. That was a very long answer to your question. <laughs> the short answer to your question: There are other groups that come inside. There are other church groups specifically, but. Most of them have not been allowed inside for the last two years, which also has meant that those few of us who've been allowed inside, we've been doing a lot of um, sponsoring of other groups, which means that when that group meets, uh, they have to have someone who's not incarcerated present. And so, you know, I've, over the last two years, I've spent a lot of time sitting in with the Muslims when they meet or the Buddhists when they meet or other groups so that they could still gather um, and, uh, but I wasn't obviously leading their services because I don't know anything about them. Um, you had your hand raised before I went down that long response. <laughs> um, I was, I'm curious about how you got uh, interested in this kind of thing. <laughs> 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 I appreciate you laughing at that, Pastor Seth. Uh, uh, Melanie Walschleiger used to be uh, on the Synod staff in Tacoma. Uh, she was what's called the Director of Evangelical Mission, the DEM. Melanie was responsible, that role is responsible for all of the, um, how do I put it in church talk? The misfits, the congregations, the ministries that aren't regular churches. Uh, new starts, redevelopments, uh, first generation communities, all sorts of things that just don't quite fit the box that traditionally we try to box everything. Um, Melanie and I have been friends for years. And in early 2018, uh, I got a call from Mel saying, uh, hey, Chris, it was basically, hey, Chris, the position at Living Stones is open. I was hoping I could talk with you about it. And my first thought, I didn't say it out loud, my first thought was, well, that's nice. That's never gonna happen. <laughs> I'm not a prison ministry guy. But then I thought a little bit more and I thought, you know, I really like Mel and we have not gotten to talk for quite a while. And if I drive down to Tacoma, she'll buy me a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so that was literally why I went down. I was like, I'll listen to her pitch, but this is never gonna happen. Like, what were you doing? I was serving time? a regular church as it were in Shoreline, uh, oh. Washington, just North of Seattle. Okay. And, um, and I, I, was, I kinda knew that it was starting to be time to look at transitioning out of there. We'd done a lot of, I'd helped them through the process of selling an aging building. Uh, buying and moving into a, a, a storefront in a uh, basically an urban village setting. Um, so I knew something was, it was time for something to change soon, but I did not think it was time for me to go to prison. Like <laughs> that was not on my radar at all. Um, and because uh, I, I knew the, I knew the founding pastor. I knew the pastors who'd been there before and, and like Eric Wangenholk in particular, the guy who served there first, he had such a burning passion for prison ministry and, and such a, I, I just, I looked at him and I'm like, well, that's not me. So I don't fit that, I don't fit that template. So um, no, but um, I went, I listened to Melanie's pitch. And by the end of the congregation, I had for some reason agreed to meet with the call committee. <laughs> Still thinking it was never going to happen. And this is stupid and I'm wasting their time. I kept, I was just, very deliberately, I'm like, I'm just leading them on. This is horrible. Um, and then I, I met with the call committee and they wanted me to go inside and worship with the men. And I kept thinking to myself, this is stupid. I'm leading them on. This is not okay. Yeah, sure, I'll go. Um, and just like, this is, why am I saying yes to this? And, um, and then I walked in for the first time and I fell in love. I just was, I was stupefied. Um, and it was just so, 
ah, you gave me the transition I was looking for. I didn't know it. <laughs> Can you open up the uh, where's this Livingstone's his church? Can you bigify that uh, uh, that link? Yeah, right there, perfect. And then uh, if you could uh, cancel that <laughs> uh, to your upper right, you can't see it. It's underneath the Zoom call. Uh, if you minimize the Zoom call. I can't decide if I should go help or just I'm enjoying directing like this. Then if you hit the X right there, we can get rid of the bad that we don't need. And then hit play, please. Hopefully you can hear okay. The Living Stones Prison Congregation. We gather in the name of the works. We hear the word of God. We share a family meal. We are sent by the Spirit. We are just like you, church, in a place where hope can be hard. God still speaks. God's community still gathers. God's Spirit still prevails. Now, let's see. Um, that's what I got hooked on. I, I just, I fell in love. I, I just, it, it spoke to me in a way I did not expect. And I realized uh, when they called that night and asked uh, if I would accept the call after we'd, after I'd, you know, led worship and met with the guy as I got this phone call on the drive home, two hour drive home. And, uh, cause I still live in Shoreline. Um, and uh, I remember when, when uh, Eric uh, Udo Guerrero, I hear you pronounce his name. Um, when he called and told me that the call committee was extending the call and hoping I would say yes, I said, I need to speak with my wife. Because <laughs> <laughs> until then, uh, this whole time, I'd been convinced that like this is never going to happen. <laughs> and then, like, oh no. <laughs> okay, I see what you did there, God. That was funny. <laughs> so, yeah, it is. It's a really humbling thing to do. It's really and and also invigorating. And I know we have some folk here who are very involved with the women's prison, uh, and and can speak on that as well and have had that experience. And it's, you know, the thing that I constantly hear from our volunteers and especially from our visitors is um, so often from visitors they will come out from worship and say, you know, I I thought I was bringing something in, and instead I'm taking something out. And, and not in a way that violates security or anything like that, like it's, you know, but it's, but it's true. Like it's, it is, it is a very, it's a very humbling experience, but also a very invigorating one. Um, you know, Pastor Seth mentioned, um, you know, trauma and grief um, that we've all experienced these last couple of years. And I have learned so much about trauma and grief working in this context and about the importance of healthy endings uh, healthy transitions um, and their role in healthy beginnings. You know, so many of our guys, that is a huge piece of their lived experience is that that they didn't get, they weren't dealt a full hand to begin with. Um, you know, there's some exceptions. There's some guys where you listen to their story and you're like, wow, it really was just a couple little choices you made that helped you get here. But some of these guys, you listen to their stories and you just, you know, like, wow, you had no chance. <laughs> like, not that you had to be here specifically, but all these things I take for granted in my life, you, you got none of those. Um, but, but on the trauma and grief is such a huge piece of, of what they are dealing with. You notice in the video, uh, there was a point where there was a laying on of hands at one point. That was part of our sending ritual that we do. Um, early, early on, I realized that we had a lot of guys who were moving out somewhere else. They were either being released, their time with, you know, inside was up, or they were being transferred. Um, at that point in time, we were, the Shelton prison is where every male identified inmate starts. It's called the reception center. And so about two thirds of the population there is constantly turning over. If you watch that video, the guys in jumpsuits are in reception and the guys in khaki are in general population. So the guys in khaki, I know much better because they've been with us for a while. Some of them predate me by years. Some of them have been there since Living Stone started 16 years ago. 
but the guys in the jumpsuits are typically with us for a short period before they move on. And so we quickly realized, um, you know, there is this, there's this turnover that's happening, this change that's happening. Um, and I remembered as a kid, I grew up at Messiah Lutheran in Auburn. And I remember as a kid, sometimes when a family would leave, there'd be this little uh, like blessing we would do, sending someone on their way, and, you know, kind of wishing them the best uh, as they went forward. And so we took that idea of that sending ritual, modified it, and then worked it into uh, just a regular part of worship. So every week I would ask, uh, does anyone either know or suspect that this is their last time gathering with us? Um, and I always put it that way because a lot of times they don't know. They might suspect. They often have a sense that it's coming, but sometimes it gets dropped on them pretty quickly and they don't actually know they're going to get shipped out. Um, and so then what we would do is we would take a moment just to, uh, to do a, a quick, you know, laying on of hands and, uh, and bless that person. And I always tell them, you know, worst case scenario, we just bless you twice. It's okay. Like, let's, <laughs> no one's going to get too much grace. It'll be fine. Um, and so we would do that every time to help people, you know, with that. But, but talking with them about grief and about trauma and about, you know, working through a lot of that has become something that I knew was important early on, but it's been really, really heightened these last couple of years. And, and a, lot of, a lot of what we see with the problems when they get out and those who come back, um, and unfortunately some of them do, um, there is a high correlation between that and, and, and issues of grief and trauma that have not been dealt with. And, and there aren't a lot of opportunities in the system for them to deal with it. And so trying to create those as part of worship, trying to create conversation around that. Um, two, two services that we've really emphasized uh, in my time at Living Stones um, that, I mean, I didn't not care about them in the past, but I've really come to realize how important they are. Uh, All Saints Day is something that we really spend a lot of focus on uh, every year. And, and taking that moment to, as a community, um, mourn and celebrate. Um, and then also Father's Day, which I know is not a church holiday, but, you know, on the outside and other congregations I've served, I didn't, I kind of wanted to downplay Father's Day and Mother's Day. I didn't want to turn it too much into like a, you know, like a, let's do the secular thing in church. Um, but my thinking on that has really been reframed by this experience. Um, because what it means to be a father while you are incarcerated. And, you know, candidly for some of these guys, they are incarcerated for crimes involving their children. Like it's, it's a huge thing to try to unpack. And not that we've ever just fixed it, <laughs> especially in just one service, but giving them some opportunities to wrestle with it and to, to try to untangle some of that. Um, you know, ultimately around 90 to 95% of those who are incarcerated will eventually be released. And so, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, ethically, you know, as a pastor, as a Christian, um, ethically, morally, we should care about their rehabilitation. But even if you don't care about that, which side note, I don't know how you do that and then still call yourself Christian, but, um, but even if you don't, pragmatically, they're going to come out. And it's pragmatically in our best interest to provide an opportunity for individuals to, to rehabilitate, to change. Um, it doesn't mean that we forget. You know, we have that horrible expression, forgive and forget. Like that's, that's not really what forgiveness looks like. That's not what moving forward looks like. Um, but figuring out how to heal and how to, how to help these guys um, reclaim their own humanity is a vital piece of helping ensure that this cycle doesn't keep getting perpetuated. Who else has some questions? See how long this is why I never worry about filling time. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Do you have any idea uh, generally of the uh, of color? I do, actually. I could just look it up right now, but I can tell you some of those numbers off the top of my head. The question had to do with the demographics of the prison system. Um, we have an, I, I'm just going to say it, we have an incredibly racist uh, prison system. I don't think it's because any individual has said, let's make it that way. I don't think it's anything like that. But for whatever combination of reasons, it is, it's just how it has developed. 
And, and then you see the numbers in that when you look. In Washington state, about 6% of the population self-identifies as black or African-American, 6%. Our incarcerated population is 18%. That is three times higher. In Washington state, about 0.2% of our population self-identifies as uh, American Indian or Native American or whatever specific tribal affiliation. Um, our incarcerated percentage for, uh, for that group is I think it's either around 0.8% or 1%, which is four or five times the percentage. In terms of raw percentage points, that isn't much, but as far as like, you know, thinking about over-representation, that is huge. Our state is still something like 70% white. Our prison system is, I believe, somewhere around 60%. And those 10 percentage points mean a lot when you're talking about that many people. And so I, I'm firmly a believer that you look at those numbers, you really have to ask yourself, okay, well, something's happening here. And it really boils down in my mind to either you think something's wrong with the system or you think something's wrong with the specific demographics that are being overrepresented. Well, one of those answers is correct. The other one's incredibly racist and ignorant. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and, and just to go on my soapbox for a moment, <laughs> um, you know, we, we see that when you look at the reasons why people are incarcerated and you look at, you know, the likelihood, I, I'm not going to give you specific examples right now, but if, if we really wanted to, we could do some quick searching and I could show it to you in black and white, no pun intended. Um, but I mean, if, if I was standing here and, um, and my friend Nathan was standing here, uh, who, who is black. Um, and the two of us were accused of the same crime. Statistically speaking, he is more likely to be convicted. I'm more likely to get a plea deal. Um, and he is going to serve more time than I am going to serve. And it, it, the details don't matter. The only part of it that matters right then is who has more or less melatonin. That's it. Like that's the only thing in the system that shows up. What is the, uh, the demographics of the staff working? It, it varies. Um, the staff demographics are heavily influenced by the location of the prison. And so that, that can be an issue. Um, I showed you earlier the map of where everyone is located. Well, we saw this happen during the pandemic. Now, fortunately, early on, the good thing about shutting down visitation and volunteers was we did see in this state for dramatically lower uh, rates of infection, especially early in the pandemic compared to some other states. Uh, and in, in states like Ohio, they had prisons where 80, 85% of the population was infected in the first two months. There, there are states in our country where you can measure the number of dead inmates in the thousands. In Washington state, we've had 16, not found 16, period, which is still too many. But the reason it's so low is we were able to keep the infection rate in this state very low until that first winter. Uh, the winter of 2020, around Thanksgiving, keep that date in mind, Thanksgiving 2020 is when we saw the, the infection rate in our prison spike beyond belief. Now, volunteers weren't being let in. Visitors weren't being let in. I am 99% sure that the inmates weren't leaving and coming back. <laughs> so the only real vector left was staff. Well, what happens at Thanksgiving? People decided, you know what? It's a holiday. It's not that big a deal. I'm going to go spend time with my family. I'm going to just, things will be fine. And we saw our numbers explode. And they've never really fully been contained since then. They, they're now finally coming back, but um, in the good way. But we, we saw, we went from you know these, these little tiny rates. I could, we could look up the DOC website. It's all there if you ever want to look. Um, it, it just, it, it went off the charts and, and fortunately it took long enough for that to happen, that we didn't have the death rates of other states. Um, but we did see, um, you know, thousands of people start getting warehoused on, uh, the gym floor and, um, you know, just all sorts of alternative housing options were created because they were trying to keep people separated and it just, it got ugly. And then it died down in early 2021. And then sure enough, right around the holidays again, it was Thanksgiving 2021, we learned nothing 
from the past. And uh, Thanksgiving 2021, we saw the numbers explode again. And I know your question was about the demographics of the staff, but um, it just, it really does vary so much based on which facility. Like, like Connell out in uh, Coyote Ridge, most of its staff is being drawn from the Tri-Cities and from Ritzville. So it is um, relatively light on uh, black identified staff and relatively high on Latino um, compared to the DOC as a whole. And that's because of where it's drawing its, its people from. Uh, you know, here in the Puget Sound area and Purdy and Shelton, we have um, a much higher percentage of black identified staff um, than you would see in some other prisons. And that's probably because Tacoma, uh, Everett, those are two of our uh, cities that have a higher percentage of people who are black. Um, and so Tacoma, or excuse me, uh, Shelton, Purdy, and Monroe tend to have a higher percentage of staff then. Um, yeah. You had a question, and I'm so sorry. Uh, your uh, focus is rehabilitation. Yes. How would you describe the general focus of the prison system itself? And we're recording. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, question was about how I would describe the general focus of the prison system itself. Um, I think the majority of the individuals within the system try hard. And, and I'm not just saying that as a political answer. I honestly do believe that. My experience of working with um, the administration at multiple sites um, and turnover of administration at multiple sites is that I have routinely seen an emphasis from the administration on things like rehabilitative programming. Um, and, and I'm grateful for that. And especially because through this work, I've gotten to know people doing prison ministry in many other states. And it has made it very starkly clear to me the difference between how it is handled here and how it is handled in some other states. Um, now, having said that, it's still far from perfect um, because at the end of the day, there is, it's, a, it's an institution. Um, there are budget concerns. There are always people who are looking to um, save money at any, any cost, save money short-term at any long-term cost. You know, as Americans, we're great at that. <laughs> As humans, we're great at that, short term, all the time. Um, the majority of the people who I have gotten to know there, I, I think really are trying their best within a flawed system to help individuals turn things around. Um, there are absolutely though, people who do not fit that mold. Um, there are some COs, some correctional officers, some guards um, I can think of who I would say embody every horrible stereotype from a movie or a TV show. There aren't many of them, but they absolutely exist. Um, and even though the administrators may have the heart for that focus, it doesn't always play out that way for a variety of reasons. Um, some of it around, a lot of it around money, honestly. That is the biggest hurdle is that it is expensive to rehabilitate someone. It is expensive in the short term to put in the time and energy into the programming that will actually have an impact. It is not cheap in the short term. In the long term, you could argue it does pay off and you can even cite the studies that show that it does pay off. But, but in the short term, it doesn't, it doesn't have the same easy fix as just throwing someone in a room and locking the door. And so you know, when, when budget cuts happen, the first things that get cut are often program related. Um, to use an example at Monroe, on paper, they are supposed to have three chaplains. They have one. For those who don't know, one is less than three. <laughs> um, the prison in Shelton, on paper, they're supposed to have two chaplains. They have one. And I can't even find anyone who's worked there who knows, who can remember when they last had two. As near as I could figure, it's been close to 20 years since they've had two. When I started, I happened to glance at a, uh, a, you have to wait through various lines, like going through security. And there was a thing that was showing like open positions. And I was, you know, killing some time looking at it. And I noticed on there, there was this open chaplain position. It's like, what? Sure enough, found out, yeah, it's been open for decades. Um, 
but it hasn't been filled because you know money. Um, so yeah, so uh, no, in the sixties, I always think well with uh, uh, juveniles in the juvenile system, and uh, it's clearly focused. This is all for rehabilitation. Yeah. My sense today is that the judicial system has backed off. I would argue that we are, as a country and as a state, still recovering from the 80s when it comes to our prison system. Um, a lot of damage was done in the, in the 80s when it comes to how we handle um, mental illness and uh, in our prisons. Um, there was, I, I might offend someone with this, and I don't care. I'm going to say it anyway, because um, <laughs> uh, you don't have to deal with me next week. Uh, but but recently, my, my eldest child, some, Tavin is 13, something came up. I can't remember what it was. I just remember the punchline was he, he asked a question. I said, um, well, son, at the end of the day, you can just blame the 80s and Reagan. And then I said, now that I think about it, a lot of the questions you've asked me in life, that's the answer. <laughs> um, but but like the changes that were made around mental illness and and I, yeah, warehousing people for mental illness, not a great idea. Not saying it was, um, but just throwing them out on the streets doesn't help either. And I think, I, I hope we've figured that out. Like, I think we can all acknowledge that doesn't work. Um, you know, there, there's definitely a heart amongst many people for rehabilitation within the system. And, and something that, as an example of that, something that warmed my heart early on was uh, when I started at Shelton, I was asked to, to uh, to preside at an inmate's funeral. And as no the visitor center, I've only been there a couple of weeks of just getting to know people. And I'm, I'm standing next to the, uh, the superintendent, the warden, um, and a little scared because I don't really know him at all. And, uh, and he's in charge of everything. And, uh, and I wanna make a good impression. And we're standing there, we're watching guys get processed in because they all had to get strip searched on the way in and strip searched on the way out. So we weren't watching the strip search, but we're watching them come out from the rooms. And as they're coming in, they're getting seated and the inmates' families, you know, the guy who got died, his family is there. Um, and, and Dan, uh, Dan White, he's looking at the guys. He just kind of starts nodding his head. And he goes, you know, these are the guys who are trying to make this place more than just a prison. These are the leaders. And, and as I looked out in that room, I kid you not, two thirds, three quarters of those guys, I already recognized from living styles. And so like it spoke to me, one, about the impact that that ministry was already having. And two, it said a lot to me that the guy in charge recognized that because he didn't have to. It would have been very easy for him to just blow that off as not important, but he could see it from where he was that they were having a positive impact inside. Um, and, and I've heard that from other administrators, literally every superintendent I have worked with, every warden I have worked with, that has been their mindset, has been on rehabilitation. Um, but they are having to do it within a very broken system. And, and that's the challenge, is that um, the system is not set up to do what I think most of us recognize needs to be done when it comes to re rehabilitative services. You know, so much of it is dependent upon volunteers. So much of it is dependent upon volunteers. And as you all know, working in, <laughs> you're all in a church. Parallels, <laughs> kind of funny. Um, you know, when it comes to the importance, importance of volunteer labor, like without the volunteers, everything falls apart. And so pre-pandemic, it was already an issue. But during the pandemic, when volunteers can't get inside, it's been hell. It has been awful. Um, what can you say about uh, mental health uh, treatment and and just the whole approach to? I'm, I'm sure that there are many mental health issues. So, are these issues addressed at all? Yeah. Um, not that for non-committal, yes. Um, there's at Monroe. There's a place called the Special Offenders Unit which is um, focused on individuals who have, have, who are lower functioning, have a lot of mental health needs. Um, and 
And so there's, there's approaches like that. And even within quote, regular prisons, um, you know, most of the, most of the treatment is going to be uh, medicinal pharmacological. It's going to be, you know, the, there isn't really any budget for, for any kind of counseling therapy, things like that. It's, it's very much, everything is dollar focused and, 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 and I get that to a point, but, but there are limits on that. And, um, you know, if, yeah, I was about to go down a whole thing. Did I kind of answer your question? So, that's enough. Not, there's no counseling level. <laughs> um, not really, not in a consistent way. So, if you have a physical health issue, you're getting a pill. Yeah, I mean, if you, have, if you have an ongoing counseling need, really what's going to happen is if you are fortunate, you might have, everyone is assigned a counselor, but it's not, I, it's no disrespect to the individuals who do that job, it's very hard but they don't get to do any counseling. Like it's a, it's a, that's not their job. Like it would be more accurate to refer to them in a social work kind of capacity when it comes to doing the details around someone's release and kind of like what their process inside looks like and dealing with discipline issues or other things. Like they don't, I have yet to meet a guy who has ever referred to his relationship with his counselor that implied anything involving some sort of counseling <laughs> um it, like, I, not at all i the, the majority of guys if they get counseling it's going to be through religious services um like i do some of that on the inside not formally obviously but or maybe it's not obvious not formally but they lean on that sort of approach and you know i can do what i can do but i'm not a trained therapist and i'm not going to pretend i am and even if I was on the outside, I would work with the congregant for a bit, but I would absolutely refer them to someone who was a trained professional. Um, you know, if, 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 if you gave me like unlimited money and a magic wand that I could just go poof and fix pieces of the system, I mean, that's a place that I would start, would be to start figuring out ways to, to budget for things like that. And again, I, that's, that's what it keeps always coming down to is that budget piece is, you know, it's, it's, there is a strong incentive within the existing system to focus on um, the short-term bottom dollar. No, no one wants to come out. It's, it is hard to find the political will to come out speaking in favor of therapy for sex offenders. There's not a lot of people out there who want to be like, yes, I'm here to defend the rights of sex offenders. You know, that, that does not sell. And yet most individuals who are convicted of those crimes are eventually going to be released. And so morally, we should care about that. And if we don't care about it morally, practically, we should care about that and want to figure out a way to help someone, you know, get therapy and get, get what is needed to, to make changes. But it's expensive and it takes time. And, and then also because the DOC is a political institution, there are times where you see, you know, the winds of political change having an impact on the direction of what's going on. You know, as, as the secretary of the Department of Corrections changes, you see changes in focus. And, and that's not always helpful because it can, it can really derail what's going on. Um, that bottom dollar thing, this is relevant, I think. There's a unit at Monroe called the Washington State Reformatory Unit. It is the second oldest prison in the state. It is Monroe's five prisons, by the way. It's not one. It's, it's five prisons working kind of together. Um, the Washington State Reformatory Unit was built in either 1908, 1910, depending on who you ask. Um, it was originally designed as a juvenile facility. Um, so it's, it's, it's cramped. It's cold in the winter. It is burning hot in the summer. It smells. It's got giant concrete walls. It's the old school. It looks like Shawshank Redemption. Like it is, it is, it is an old building. And for the record, there's no such thing as like a vintage, like what a nice craftsman prison. That's a fixer up. <laughs> you know, like, Man, that was great. You know, look at the Wayne Scotting on there. Um, I don't actually know what Wayne Scotting is. I just know that if I say that, people laugh. So. <laughs> but um, WSR is the most expensive facility in the state to operate because of its age and because of its location. 
And so it's largely been mothballed now over the last year. They've been, they call it a warm closure because they're keeping like all the connections valid and you know they're still putting heat through and stuff but they aren't there aren't pe there aren't very many people there um on the one hand it's awesome it's great because it's not a very humane place on the other hand um that's one of the prisons a lot of guys like to be at because again it's closer to their families and while it's miserable they recognize the value of having access to the volunteers and their families and their support groups and so it's so it's an example of how complicated this is, like because it's on the one hand, the ethical decision is to shut that thing down. And on the other hand, there are a lot of guys who really like to be there because of because of its proximity to family and how much that's helped them with their their recovery. Um, and because the rooms are because the cells are so small because of the built for children. Um, there's a sentence. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, because the cells are so small, they're you they're pretty much all singles. And so that's another thing that the guys like is that they don't have to have a cellmate, um, you know, and it, yeah, anyway. Um. Well, I, yeah, going back to the uh, staff issues, do any of the staff participate in the services? Yeah, so well, and it, the staff, I mean, that's another thing where like I, I never want to be accused of beating up on staff because I've been so impressed with so many of them. Um, there are a lot of staff members who lead programs in their downtime. Like there are, there are staff members who have their blue badge. I know we're getting close to like worship. Um, there are staff members who have their blue badge for when they're on duty, but also have a red badge for when they come back later to volunteer. And they might run an AA group, or they might be involved with teaching yoga, or they might uh, lead a Bible study or something. And 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 I'm really impressed by that. Like that, there's a lot of staff members there who've tried very hard to contribute to that piece of the puzzle um yeah okay i'm sorry what healthcare healthcare for inmates Mental. it exists um it's, it's a leading question yeah like it's like it, it it exists it's it's sporadic i mean it's it's not the best you know it's um there's a guy who I've known for years, who's one of our longtime members of Living Stones who has cancer. And, um, and so his treatments are, they're either at, he, he alternates between a couple of different facilities that they send him to for it. And, um, and you know, it's, there's, there's a lag time. Like it's, I, it happens on the outside too, where, you know, you, you're supposed to get scheduled for something and things get delayed and, and all of that, but it's, it's heightened. On the inside, you know, it's it's not a huge priority for a lot of a lot of folk. Are you, is your congregation uh, connected with people on the outside or the Yeah, so that's something that we. And for those who have to go, I understand. I'm not offended, uh, unless you want to be to be offended. No, I'm still not offended. It's okay. Um, the uh, because of the way the DOC works, as people who are inside all the time, having an ongoing connection to individuals who are currently incarcerated we are not allowed to be involved with people once they leave. And so it has to for, for a year, which greatly complicates reentry services because, but I mean, it might as well be not a year, but life, because, you know, if you're not involved with someone for a year after they've just been released from prison, you are probably never seen that person again, realistically. Um, and so over the last few years, we've been developing a relationship and a partnership with a group called underground ministries. Uh, which was begun by the Presbyterians up in Skagit County. And, um, and Underground Ministries is specifically focused on a program they have called One Parish, One Prisoner. And it's the idea of training a group of people within a congregation to serve as a um, support team for an individual um, up to about a year or so before they re-enter society. And so it, there's, there's, you know, there's training and support services available for the group um, to work on that. And the idea, and then, um, and then the, the group's responsibility is to to pray with that for that person, to be available to that person, not to like, hey, come be a member of our church, but to be available for things like, hey, this guy doesn't know how to apply for a job online. Hey, this guy's never used a smartphone before. Hey, you know, like working with some of these life issues that make adjusting back to the outside more difficult. Um, and so underground ministries is, is they're really cool. And because they're exclusively focused on the outside, 
it's a great partnership because we could basically hand someone over and help that person with their reentry without actually breaking any policies. And for those of you, if you've ever gone to Holden Village or considered it, um, I'm actually going to be teaching, co-teaching with their director, uh, a workshop at Holden Village this summer, uh, June 25th through July 2nd. We're out there, um, and um, and should be should be good. He's he's bringing uh, one of their alums out as well, who's going to be a part of teaching that. So I think it will be uh, powerful. So, um, I guess it's kind of a wrap up. You know, I'll stay as long as anyone wants, but as a wrap up. Uh, livingstonespc.org is our website. You can find out all the information about what we're doing there. Um, with this announcement that volunteers can come back inside, that means we're right on the verge of being able to have visitors come back and be a part of this. And I'd really encourage you to consider having a group from Agnes Day come out and experience that. Um, it is, it's humbling, I think is really a, a good way of looking at it. Um, and it's deceptively normal. I think that's one of the things that always blows people away is that, yeah, it's in a prison, but it's, it's worship. It's, it's actually very familiar in that sense. Um, we always can use, we always can use financial help <laughs> individually and congregationally, just as a heads up. Um, although Agnes Day has helped us over the years, so thank you for that. Um, but I mean, prayer, uh, you know, we, we do a lot of book donations that go inside. We do uh, clothing donations uh, for guys who are released homeless. Um, you know, like I say, we're working with this reentry program now. All of that information is on our website, um, and uh, as is my contact information and also my assistance. So, when are the services? Oh, what? When is the service that you said? Not <sighs> so, the thought is we'll be going back to what we were doing, which is Saturday night. Okay. Um, people would gather at the prison at 5 30. We'd do some orientation and process through security, and then the worship service would start more or less at 6 30. In the prison, start time is always a little bit iffy because it assumes that they call it movement. It assumes that movement is happening at the right time, but it might be the guys show up a little late or a little early and you just kind of adjust. Um, and then worship service has been two hours. Um, and then, uh, but it goes fast. And we have a really good worship team. They're rusty because it's been two years, but they'll pick it up. Um, and there's you know, a lot of music, prayer, uh, you know, the word, sermon, uh, uh, what I want to say, uh, communion, um, uh, sending blessing, more prayer. Prayer and music is a huge piece of our gathering. Uh, and, uh, and then afterwards, do some debriefing with people and then let them go on their way home. Um, but yeah, Saturday night at 6.30 is the worship time. 5.30 is when we would gather. Um, currently, we're having to gather midweek because uh, in the pandemic, the chapel was converted into a COVID recovery facility. And we haven't gotten it back yet. We're supposedly getting it back soon, but right now we work. We, right now we worship in the staff dining hall, uh, which is awful. Um, it's uh, it's loud and it's fragrant, and uh, and it's not in a part of the facility where people could be at night. So we can't gather when we would normally gather. Like we, for security reasons, we have to gather in the middle of the day on Wednesdays, um, and so it's really inconvenient for a lot of people right now. But that will be changing soon. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here and, and 